It is Friday, December 25th. Let's talk PlayStation. Merry Christmas, everybody, and happy holidays. This year, Let's Talk PlayStation falls on Christmas Day, so assuming you even have time to watch this right now, I do hope you are enjoying your day with uh, your family, friends, whatever you have going on. Even if it's nothing to you, I hope you do have a good time. But we do have some PlayStation news to go over. Not a whole lot, but let's get into it with our PlayStation Plus reminder. We don't know what January's titles will be just yet, but you still have some time left to download the December titles, which is Rocket Arena, Just Cause 4, and Worms Rumble. For our first news story, let's talk about Ghost of Tsushima update 1.18. This one adds uh, basically matchmaking, so if you remember when the Legends multiplayer mode dropped and we got raids a little bit shortly after, uh, the one weird decision there was that you couldn't actually matchmake with random players, so you pretty much needed to coordinate with friends or meet somebody online on a forum or whatever to try and arrange uh, playing with somebody that way. But now there is an option to actually fill in those previous missing roles. You can do this if you're alone as well, so that makes it a little bit easier if you've been trying to actually play raids. And Sucker Punch recently added four new armor sets for the Legends mode that are unlockable by January 15th, and they're PlayStation themed. So I always love when we see crossovers like these, especially for PlayStation IP, and it's really cool. You can get a God of War themed armor set for the Samurai role, or Horizon Zero Dawn armor for the Hunter, Shadow of the Colossus for the Assassin, or Bloodborne armor for the Ronin. You can unlock any of these by playing a story or survival mission, and then you'll unlock it for that corresponding class. And uh, this will only be available until January 15th so I don't know what they'll do after the fact possibly put it up for sale or something like that or um, just release it by some other means but if you want to grab any of these armor sets you have to at least play one mission before January 15th. Moving on to our next news story, Returnal, the upcoming PS5 exclusive that launches March 19th, 2021. We know a fair amount about this game so far. We've seen two trailers so far, and we know that it's a roguelike, bullet hell, typical housemark fashion. Well, recently from their YouTube channel, they posted, uh, they've been doing this thing called the Housecast, where they're giving out more details about the game, and part of episode two, they actually showed some extended gameplay clips. I mean, it's not that long, but it's more meaty than, say, the gameplay trailers that we've seen so far for the game, because naturally those trailers were cut up for presentations like live streams and uh, so usually the gameplay is spliced up so much to where you can't really see much too long before it moves over to another section of gameplay this at least we can get a good idea of what the gameplay loop is going to play and feel like or at least you've got a better idea of it than before and um, there's a lot of verticality going on there's a lot of uh, I mean this is naturally part of the game of course because it's a, a third person perspective whereas before House Mark's always known for top-down, side-scrolling, but they are very much known for the, the bullet hell action that you see. And so, uh, for these clips at least, you can certainly see a lot of that going on here. There's so much on screen, but you're seeing this dashing mechanic that you're going to be probably leveraging quite a lot when you're playing the game. And uh, again, you're just you're, there's a lot of jumping, a lot of moving around. I love how twitchy and fast-paced it is. That's what's getting me really excited for this title. Um, they actually told us a few things about it. The game director Harry Kruger was discussing how the title is actually uh, codenamed Dark Planet and uh, they talk about how this is their dream project. They've been building up to something like this. They also discuss various other aspects of the game like uh, well for one in the gameplay you can see the grappling hook so that's more verticality to the environment. You can just there's a lot of ways that you can get around um, those little arenas when you're fighting all these aliens, but there's mechanics like securing certain areas against the aliens um, There's proficiency levels. It seems like there's a lot going on a lot of depth and I'm really enjoying that They also discussed that there is a narrative team for this project, which is not something that they've had before they've had contacts under certain Certain twin stick shooters and things like that But it's not necessarily a story that you have to follow unlike what's happening in here So I'm really loving what I'm seeing so far But one thing that's kind of slipping under the radar with Returnal is the game's price tag because when the game got its release date announcement you could also pre-order it but it's not available on retail sites you can only pre-order it from the playstation store or playstation direct and this is where you'd find out that this game is part of the price hike for say something like demon souls where it's 70 dollars um and the thing is with ps5's launch and some of these cross-gen titles and to sony's credit where jim ryan actually spoke about this yes there is a price hike but they are exploring various price points for a lot of their first party games so it's not necessarily always going to be 70. Um, you are seeing things like spider-man miles morales being at 50 which naturally you'd expect that game to be 50 dollars it's it's quite short and then you're seeing sackboy epic adventure which was 60 dollars um that that game's got a fair amount of content to it you can play a lot in sackboy epic adventure but that's also a cross-gen title and then we saw destruction all-stars which was priced at 70 but we saw the quick u-turn that that game saw 
where it got pushed to PlayStation Plus, where it's now being given away for free, which is basically saying, yeah, it was 70, now we'll just hand it out to everybody that um, is eligible. Now, Returnal, $70, that's interesting. I mean, obviously we've discussed the price point situation a few, a few times prior on this channel. You know my take, which is that you don't have to buy anything on day one. You never have to feel pressured to buy on day one. You can let games devalue because that's what happens. They, they lose value over time. You can see sales, price drops. I mean, you know, how do you value that particular game? You should do it on a personal basis, not necessarily on this blanket basis of, oh, it's 70, I shouldn't pay it 70, I mean, Wait it, wait it out and then you can pay what you feel comfortable with. But for Returnal, it's interesting because I definitely expected this game to not launch at 70. I expected it to be probably in the range of 50 like Miles Morales or maybe even 40. And so to see it at 70, just like Destruction All-Stars, it's, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I could argue that this is probably in a better position than Destruction All-Stars, but at the same time, I mean, it's still a tough pill to swallow for day one. Yes, you can wait it out for the game to drop price, but I don't want the overall image of this game to be damaged long term. So even when it does go on sale, it's just not something that's in the back of people's minds. You do want this game to have a, a successful launch. So I wonder if they are going to adjust this once they see as it gets closer to launch that you know pre-orders aren't there, especially once retailer pre-orders go up. Um, the game will launch as a traditional disc and everything. So, I mean, clearly they're thinking that this is going to be a bigger game than what it's initially being marketed as, but perhaps the uh, marketing will ramp up as the game gets closer to launch. But I have suspicions that this title is, is going to see more pressured conversations as it gets closer to launch. And I don't want this game to be in a place where it is really good, but it's just not going to move any units on PS5. Moving on to some updates for the Cyberpunk 2077 situation. This past week on PS4, we saw update 1.05 and 1.06 pushed out. And remember, if you didn't accept Sony's offer for a full refund on PSN, your copy of the game can still accept downloads and patches. So if you're actively playing the game right now, you've probably already received these. And uh, hopefully the experience is a little bit better for you in terms of crashes and bugs, not too much there. but. Of course, CD Projekt Red still has a lot of work ahead of them, and for CD Projekt Red, they have confirmed that they will honor, out of their own pocket, um, retail refunds if you've got proof of purchase, which I think as of filming this right now and posting this, uh, we're past the deadline. I think that was actually the 21st, but um, at least here in the U.S., GameStop stores are um, opening up their policy a little bit, the refund policy, so if you bought the game at retail at GameStop, even if you've opened the game, played it, you can return it there. Um, and for Microsoft, we weren't able to talk about this last week because they didn't really touch on this by the time I was filming last week. However, um, for their refund policy, they have walked outside of this as well. So if you've bought the game, you can get a full refund, no questions asked, basically. Whereas before, it was more open than PSN. You could have a little bit of playtime on that title versus PSN where you can't have any playtime. But some people were getting denied on Xbox. Now that's totally open and Microsoft did not delist the game at all and that's where we can talk about how the studio head um alex badowski actually was liking tweets on twitter that were criticizing sony or being more critical of sony's decision to remove the game and uh, of course once a video game chronicles picked the story up he then removed these tweets or unliked them so that wasn't really a good look for him uh, however they still moved like 13 million copies accounting for the refunds but that's just due to the very nature of this game. It's very infrequent that we have a title like Cyberpunk come out where there's this much hype and excitement going into it. Um, so we can talk all day about how they were deceiving, they didn't show the current gen version, put out PC review copies, but they were going to sell this on day one anyway. I mean, this is to the same level of the next GTA, the next Legend of Zelda, the next major Sony IP, whether it's five or 10 million copies on day one or within a week. You know, not many publishers can see these numbers. Um, so when you have a title like this, it's going to move that much you know, regardless of the situation. So I don't think it necessarily sets a precedence for other publishers to think that they can get away with this. If anything, they can see that, oh, well, look what happened with Cyberpunk and Sony. Sony is, you know, one of the biggest storefronts here and they've removed it. So obviously this isn't good for them or for CD Projekt Red rather. You know, the thing is, I mean, this is ugly from both sides. I mean, of course, Sony doesn't look great in this situation either. I mean, it's, it's good that they've taken a, a stance but they're doing it for good and bad reasons, of course. They've just got a terrible PSN policy. I mean, they had to make a special exception web page just for refunds like this so that it would go through um, because by their regular policy, most people wouldn't get accepted after playing, say, five hours of Cyberpunk, even one minute of Cyberpunk. I mean, this is not very friendly to the consumer. So, 
you can look at it from CD Projekt Red's point of view or Sony's. Um, they all have a little bit of ugliness attached to them. And I think coming out of this, I'm praying that Sony updates their policy to be more friendly for the consumer. Um, and I hope, of course, from CD Projekt Red's angle, they can fix their game and, and make it uh, make it better over time, which I'm sure they will do. Um, that's the thing is that there's so many comparisons being drawn, like Marvel's Avengers in the tweets is what um, Alex was uh, liking and then unliked. But, you know, that's the thing. We, we can't necessarily compare because, I mean, ideally we, we would like all these games to not do this. It's just one of these is going to end up breaking the camel's back here, and I, you know, I think Cyberpunk was probably it. But I would like to see results out of this instead of, um, you know, possibly a second example. Next up, we've got yet another notable departure from Japan Studio. This time it's Teruyuki Toriyama. He recently announced that he's leaving at the end of December to work on his own new IP at his own game studio. He's been the studio producer at Japan Studio for a very long time, overseeing many projects, ranging from Dear Asine, Bloodborne, Soul Sacrifice, um, Astrobot, more recently Demon's Souls. He's worked on, on a lot of games, and now he's doing his own thing. Um, and just to clarify, there is some separation here between the announcement we had not too long ago about Kiyo Chiyotiyama, where he's leaving to form Bokeh Game Studios, which is comprised mostly of former staff from Japan Studio, which, by the way, is a minor news story. They recently announced that their um, horror project is aimed to release in 2023, so they have a lot of work ahead of them, but we'll keep our eyes on that project and see how it turns out. But for now, at least, we've got all these departures. Um, goes back to the conversation of what's going on in Japan Studio, what's going on with Sony's relationship with the Japanese market in general. We've got a lot of reports claiming that Sony's, you know, distancing themselves away from that market and from Japanese development. You've got Sony vehemently denying all these reports, which you kind of expect that they would do that. Um, the thing is, it's hard to, to judge from the outside looking in, but of course, the, at the start of the year, we had Nicholas Dissette appointed as the new studio head of Japan Studio, which is, I guess, somewhat noteworthy just because he's not Japanese, which clearly shows that they are okay with, um, you know, bringing in Western talent if necessary. Now that that makes a huge difference, but clearly we've seen a lot of people leave um, within this same year, and that's not super indicative of anything because a lot of the times it's just a matter of, uh, you know, developers getting burned out, wanting to have some independence, doing their own thing, and for the case of these recent departures, that's what they're doing. They're moving on to have more independence, have their own studio, um, not being shackled to a big publisher and a big manufacturer like Sony. But it's not exactly easy to discuss Japan Studio without understanding where they are right now and what they're doing currently is what they've been doing for the longest time. There hasn't really been a major change outside of you know some of the restructuring that we have been seeing, which might honestly be a better direction for them. We do have to keep in mind that the vast majority of their portfolio is external development. I mean, they work with other teams for these IP, and granted, Sony still funds all these projects. It's still it's still their IP, but a lot of that workload is offset with other teams, um, and those deals are always different depending on that title, but a lot of their games are that, and then you've got some of these original games sprinkled in between, and those are developed internally right from the ground up in Japan Studio, whether that's from Team Asobi, which was formed uh, within the last seven years, or... Team Siren, Project Gravity, obviously that's where there's um, you know, a case to be made about what's going to be happening there. The current rumor is that that team is working with Konami, or at the very least just given the okay to work on a Silent Hill project where uh, Japan Studio has actually taken most of the work themselves. That's still a rumor, of course. And then you've got other projects that, again, they're far and few between. They've been like this for the longest time, and they always are underperforming titles because they're very niche in their approach, like Puppeteer, for example or Knack. I mean, we all knew that Knack wasn't really going to move that many copies. You know, a lot of these games underperform because um, you kind of expect them to, and that might be a, a problem for Sony to justify down the road, and I don't want that because I that's what I love about Japan Studio. I always call them a wild card because that's what they are. You don't know what you're going to get out of them, and it's always these weird, obscure projects that are either funny or weird or just they're super abstract or they're, they've got this color, colorful presentation. I love stuff like that. We need stuff like that in this industry. That's why it's always great to look at indies because they can explore that area and not have a huge, well, not as large of a financial undertaking versus a publisher. For indies, it's always it's always a huge financial undertaking, but not to the same scale, if you know what I mean. Um, when you look at the Japanese market, I mean, it's, it's shrinking. Uh, not as many people are buying consoles there. That's going to translate to lower software sales. Um, these games always underperform in the West anyway, so I, I don't want them to shy away from these projects, but... They really haven't. I mean, we still see them. It's It seems like it's the same frequency as it's always been. So, you know, there has been some mo some movement when it comes to the, the corporate structure. 
And as of right now, I think it's a little too reactionary to imply that something really bad is happening outside of what might be expected to happen. Because again, the market is changing. Uh, so we should expect that developers will will naturally evolve over time to meet that market demand or, or move away from what the market doesn't want. Um, it's not ideal, but I think it's expected. We, but we have to see what will actually become of that. As of right now, there's really no clear evidence that they're changing for the, for, the, for the worse, I guess. Moving on to our next news story, the CEO of Sony Pictures was speaking with CNBC, discussing how there's gonna be tighter integration between Sony's companies, calling it One Sony, which is not new. We've heard this before. In fact, I think they coined that phrase like over a decade ago. I think that was when Kaz Rai was still around. But anyway, this is presumably for PlayStation Productions and Sony Pictures because they directly state that there are 10 projects currently being worked on, three of them being movies, seven of them being TV shows, and this would be for PlayStation themed, you know, characters, content, IP, things like that, which is alarming, maybe? Would that be the best way to put it? I mean, that's a lot. Uh, right now, publicly, all we know about right now is The Last of Us HBO TV series, uh, the Uncharted movie. We knew about, say, Sly Cooper, but that was like before PlayStation Productions was formed, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think it was a TV show and a movie, one or the other. Um, we had a Ratchet and Clank movie actually come out, but that was not out of Sony Pictures, and that was also not out of PlayStation Productions. Um, so, I mean, obviously they've been, you know, testing these things for a while and, and evaluating these things, and I think that's largely what these 10 projects are outside of the ones that are publicly known that are probably going to completely release. Uh, it's a lot of projects, but I mean, and it's aggressive, but I'm guessing that they're just evaluating a lot of this stuff to see what makes sense, if this would work as a TV show, if this would work as a movie, this and that. To release 10 would be, you know, there's going to be some duds in there. <laughs> I want them, you know, I would like them to do these things. I've always said, you know, PlayStation IP can be leveraged outside of PlayStation. You can have this integration with other media, um, which will certainly encourage that brand awareness and that um, that reverence for PlayStation and, and its characters that'll encourage more PlayStation consoles being sold, more software being sold. You know, games are already big and they're so dominant as is, so they can certainly bleed out into these other mediums. But you have to do it right. You have to do it right because it always it's always done wrong, and that just damages the image more so than anything else. Uh, so I, I would want them to tread carefully on these things. Now we haven't really seen much out of PlayStation Productions just yet. So it's still up in the air in terms of if this is going to be a successful venture, but I would like to stay cautiously optimistic. Now, moving on, I'm pretty sure that this was already in place for at least the last two weeks or so, but essentially, PlayStation 5 will now warn you if you're about to play the PS4 version of a game. This was initially one of the early PS5 problems for these cross-gen games where you would be playing a, what you think is a next-gen game, but actually you're playing the PS4 version. This is usually a problem with games that feature that next-gen free upgrade from, say, the PS4 disc. Uh, or maybe it was a download and you just, for some reason, were playing the PS4 copy. It's very strange how this actually happened in the first place. I don't know why this was a problem. I mean, you should always, the, the console should always recognize being able to play by default the PlayStation 5 version. So unless you could visually see that you were playing the wrong version, some people are well into the, you know, well into Assassin's Creed or Black Ops not realizing they were playing the last gen version. So either way, there's now a prompt that will ask you, hey, you're about to play the PS4 copy, you wanna to switch to PS5, that's good. Um, yeah, that was very strange, but at the very least, uh, it looks like this is getting ironed out and pushed out to most users. I don't know if this was a hotfix server side, so if you're logged in, the prompt will show, or if this was sneakily a part of the system software update that we saw, well, within the last one or two updates, basically. But either way, it's here now. And oddly enough, what's also here is official DualSense driver support for Linux and not Windows or Mac. Um, so that's a bit strange. Not really sure what the decision was there, but there is official driver support now for Linux. Uh, I would imagine Windows is not that far behind. You can still get a DualSense to work on, on Windows, no problem, just that you'd have to use the custom configurator, say, in Steam, um, where you, you have to alter it a little bit. But official driver support makes it a lot easier, and you can access more unique features of the controller, which for this Linux support, I don't think you can actually take advantage of the haptics or the adaptive triggers, but the controller is more naturally plug and play versus what it was before, so that's good to see. I would guess that Windows is not that far behind. 
Now, finally, happy holidays. Over on the PlayStation blog, Sony put out this fantastic collection of various postcards from all your favorite developers. It seems like they do this every single year to reflect any changes for games that were recently released, but I love looking at these. Very heartwarming, so cool. And the one thing that I always do every single year is post this same Little Big Planet level that I made like seven years ago on uh, PS3 or PS4. And, uh, you know, the plan was to make this, like to make a new level every single year, but of course LBP is no longer popular. And also that level took like, I think 10 or 15 hours to make. So I, I wasn't about to do that every single year, but the level is still live. So if you've got a copy of the game, you can still go ahead and play it. And that's my little thing to you that is uh, gonna keep getting reused every single year. So enjoy it. With all that said, it's time to get to Let's Talk Plus, our weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code, and I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about with you all. Our Tuesday video was PS5 accessories from Amazon.com. Are they worth it? Just like we did with PS4. We're gonna mess up my PS5 and my DualSense and make it look ridiculous. And I think you all know that's kind of the point of those videos because they're not really that worth it, but check that out if you didn't see it just yet. And then next Friday will be January 1st, 2021. So we got a lot of great stuff coming. First full year of PS5 on the market, our annual PlayStation predictions. And you know, I really appreciate all the support that was given, given to me throughout 2020. I mean, it was a bad year, but I can thankfully say that um, for all of you being here watching, it, it made it okay for me. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And now let's just see how long we can, we can get away with doing more of that next year. Um, so that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Badecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I'll see you all next Friday.